Well, let's get into the Word of God. On Sunday mornings, we're going through 1 Corinthians chapter by chapter and verse by verse, and today we're in chapter 10, and our text will be verses 9 through 11. I'll have you turn there at this time, and once you do, if you're able, uh, stand and follow along with me as I read. If not, that's okay. Beginning in verse 9, the Apostle Paul, by the Holy Spirit, writes, We should not test Christ as some of them did, and were killed by snakes. And, verse 10, do not grumble as some of them did, and were killed by the destroying angel. These things, verse 11, happened to them as examples and were written down as warnings for us on whom the culmination of the ages has come. Let's pray. We'll ask God's blessing on our understanding, if you would join with me. Loving Heavenly Father, we're so thankful to you for your word. We desire in the time that we have together in your word to hear you speak into our lives and minister to us very specifically, very clearly, very personally even. So Lord, will you? We're asking you. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. Thank you. Today's teaching is part five of a series I titled Disqualifications for Christians. Here in chapter 10, the Apostle Paul has been using the Israelites as an example of being disqualified. And the reason he does is because that's in effect what happened to the Israelites as it relates to entering the promised land. None of them would enter the promised land save two, Joshua and Caleb. It really, for us, serves as a warning. Uh, it was to them then, the Corinthians, and to us now, because we can also be disqualified for the very same reasons. And that's why Paul offers these warnings. It's not in terms of losing our salvation. It's in terms of losing rewards, rewards in heaven and blessings on earth. In our text today, we're gonna to talk about the fifth warning, which is that of complaining and grumbling. I know none of you complain. So this is just theoretical. We'll just go through it real quickly and then. <laughs> In verse 9, Paul says that we shouldn't test Christ as some of the Israelites did, which resulted in them being killed by, of all things, snakes. <laughs> I cannot think of a more horrible way to die, you know? If my death were to precede the rapture, I just want to go quick. I don't want it to be slow <laughs> and painful. I don't do well with pain. Um, if I get a hangnail, I'm praying in my heavenly language, oh God, it hurts so bad. <laughs> I'm not complaining, I'm praying. Uh, yeah, I, didn't, uh, I don't complain. In verse 10, Paul says, we shouldn't grumble as some of the Israelites also did, and because of it, were killed by the destroying angel. And then in verse 11, he says, these happened as examples, as written warnings, really, for us, them then, us now, on whom the culmination of the ages had come. You know, it's interesting because Paul has been using specific examples of the Israelites during the wilderness wanderings, and the text before us today is no exception. He's referring to Numbers chapter 21, where we find a very interesting account of what happened when the Israelites complained not only against God, but against God's man, Moses. Numbers 21, let me read verses four through nine. 
It says, then they journeyed from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom, and the soul of the people became very discouraged on the way, and the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and our soul loathes this worthless bread. The manna, a type of the bread from heaven, Jesus the Christ, worthless bread, worthless bread. Oh, by the way, let me just parenthetically say that the common denominator in every single one of the examples that the Apostle Paul uses of the Israelites, you know what it is? Complaining. Give us meat to eat. Without exception, the Israelites were complaining from the very beginning, even before they got to the Red Sea. And they're complaining to Moses, oh, could not God find enough graves in Egypt that he had to bring us out here to kill us? Right out of the shoot, you, you would know you're not off to a good start. <laughs> I mean, you know, and here's the Egyptians right behind them. For sure, this means certain death. They started complaining from the very beginning. That was the common denominator in everything that they did, and such is the case here. We go on to read, so this is the Lord's response to their complaining. The Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and many of the people of Israel died. Therefore, the people came to Moses and said, we have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. Then the Lord said to Moses, make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole, and it shall be that everyone who is bitten, when he looks at it, shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent, put it on a pole, and so it was. If a serpent had bitten anyone, when he looked at the bronze serpent, he lived. A couple things that are going to be germane to our understanding of this example that Paul uses. First, it's important to note that at this point in the wilderness wanderings, many of the older Israelites from, the, uh, gener from that generation had already died. Uh, some of them in past uh, plagues and judgments of God. Uh, Aaron, Moses' older brother, has died at this point, so has his older sister, Mariam. Now, here's why I point that out. The children of Israel at this point are now comprised of, at least in part, the next generation as young adults. And here's the point. They learned it from their forefathers. They, they learned that whenever the going gets rough, the way you handle it is you complain. I have sat across the pastoral desk of counseling too many times. Not here. I'm talking about the mainland. I never use illustrations from here. This was on the mainland many years ago in a land far, far away. <laughs> but I've been in too many counseling sessions with parents of young teenagers who just complain. And it's not long before you realize where they learned to complain like that. Spence said that it's not what's taught, it's what's caught. That's how they learn from us. They had learned that this is what our parents did. They just complained and they murmured and they grumbled, I would suggest that complaining 
is not only contagious, but it can even be deadly. And it's not just for our children, it's for those who are close in proximity to us. I wonder sometimes as a parent, do our children catch us praying or do they catch us complaining? Is, is prayer our first response or is our first response to complain? Now, there's another issue here that kind of leaps off the pages of the text and it has to do with complaining rising to the level of sins to be included in a list with idolatry, revelry, carnality, and sexual immorality. You wouldn't think that complaining would be included in a list with these sins, but it is. Why? That's the question. Well, simply put, it's because complaining against God is a sin against God. It's interesting that Paul would write to the Corinthians not to test God. To complain against God is to test God. It is a sin against God. And as with all sin, it carries with it the death penalty. And so too is that the case with complaining. And this is Romans 6, 3. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So why does the Lord have Moses make a pole and a bronze serpent and have that bronze serpent put on that pole? Because... It's a type of the cross and the finished work of Jesus Christ on that cross. And all who would but look at it and to it would live and be saved. The pole was in a shape of a cross and it foreshadowed in its typology the finished work where Jesus Christ paid in full for all our sin, including the sin of complaining. It's really a powerful typology, so much so that Jesus himself refers to this in one of the most quoted verses, if not the most quoted verse in all of the Bible, you know it well, John 3, 16. Oh, we don't quote John 3, 14 or John 3, 15 along with John 3, 16, but listen to the words of the Savior. John 3, 14. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever would believe in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Don't you find that interesting? That in this verse, this famous verse that the Savior would reference the account that the Apostle Paul is using in his example to warn the Corinthians. I'm hoping you'll kindly allow me to share with you the most fascinating prophetic picture. It's not exhaustive, it's just a sampling really of how the snake on the pole paints on the canvas of Christ's finished work on the cross. And Pictured here, by the way, is Mount Nebo in modern day Jordan. You'll find this serpent cross sculpture by an Italian artist, Giovanni Fantoni. I'm just gonna give you a few of these uh, prophetic pictures. The first is the serpent got Eve to eat the fruit that hung on a tree and sin entered the world. 
Jesus took upon himself the curse of sin and hung on a tree for God so loved the world and cursed is any man who hangs on a tree. He took that curse. Sin entered the world, he paid for that sin when he hung on that cross. The serpent paints for us a picture of sin. This is why Jesus took upon himself all of our sin and paid in full for that sin by his death on the cross. Why bronze? Because bronze is a type of judgment. Throughout scripture, you'll always see the metal bronze associated with judgment and so too did Jesus take upon himself the judgment for us and instead of us. The bronze snake was to be lifted up on the pole just as Jesus would be lifted up on the cross. Very detailed. This one's very interesting. The serpent was horizontal on a vertical pole. Jesus became a man horizontally, if you will, and restored us to God vertically. By the way, parenthetically, there's a similar typology woven into the fabric of the Ten Commandments. The first five commandments deal vertically with God, and upon them hang the second commandments dealing horizontally with man in the shape of a cross. If you've been coming to this church for any length of period of time, especially for our uh, midweek Bible studies through the Old Testament, what's becoming abundantly clear is that the cross of Jesus Christ is pictured prophetically throughout the entirety of the Old Testament. Even when we partake together of communion today, the Passover lamb, the, the angel of death would pass over if the blood from that innocent lamb was placed on the doorpost in the shape of a cross. The, the high priests in the wave offerings in the shape of a cross, north, south, east, west. This was a foreshadow, a picture, a type of that cross that hadn't even been invented yet as a form of capital punishment. A cruel form of capital punishment. Hadn't even been invented yet by the Romans. But God is placing it here. The God who knows the end from the beginning and all of the details point to the person of Jesus Christ. Now, this is interesting. All the Israelites had to do was look upon the pole to be saved. They didn't have to touch it. They didn't have to recite anything. They didn't have to repeat after anyone. So, too, all we have to do is look to Jesus and be saved. This is Isaiah 45, verse 22. Look to me and be saved. All the ends of the earth for I am God, and there is no other. Think about this. This would have seemed foolish, right? You mean, all I have to do is just look at this bronze snake on that pole? That seems foolish to me. And it is foolish to those who are perishing. Jesus dying on the cross, the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. This is 1 Corinthians 1.18. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. When those Israelites just looked at that snake on that pole, they were healed. Sorry, I woke up people up. I, welcome back. Good to see you. We're almost done. Just hang in there. We won't be long. <laughs> this was the only way. This was the only way to be healed. Jesus is the only way 
to be saved. There's no other way to the Father except through Him. He is the way, the truth, and the life. The only way, the only door. This was the only way. It took faith. Faith being the substance of things hoped for, the evidence, strong word, the evidence of that which was yet unseen. That's what faith is. And it took faith in the unseen to look upon that pole to be saved. If they didn't, they would perish. We're saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. We're saved by grace through faith. It's not of ourselves. It's not of works. It's the gift of God, lest anyone should boast. You probably already know this, but our symbol for modern day medicine came from this passage, from this account. Uh, I don't know why they put two snake heads on there. Uh, it's just like man, right? To, you know, skew and corrupt and pervert and change. And, but this is where we get our symbol for modern day medicine. Okay. Well, what's the takeaway from our text? What's the, what's the lesson? What's your point? Okay, it's this. Don't complain <laughs> or snakes will bite you and kill you. Let's pray. <laughs> okay, that's actually, um, I, wanna <laughs> I wanna close with an Arab proverb and a Persian fable. The Arab proverb goes like this. I complain because I had no shoes until I met a man who had no feet. That put it into perspective. I'll tell you, preparing for a teaching on complaining, <laughs> as the one who's teaching the teaching on complaining, whew, I got pretty convicted this last week. That's all I'm gonna say. And now it's your turn. So next week, <laughs> you can be as convicted as I was. But doesn't that put it into perspective? You know, the Apostle Paul said that he had learned, learned, key word, learned, to be content, whether he was abased or abounding. When things were going very badly or when things were going very good, he had learned, learned, to be content no matter what. You show me a content Christian, and I'll show you a Christian full of joy. You show me a discontent Christian, I'll show you a miserable Christian to be around. <laughs> well, let me close with this Persian fable. It's about a hen, a mouse, and a rabbit. All three of them lived together in a little house, and they got along together as well. They were happy and contented because they all shared in the work. The rabbit cooked the meals, the chicken carried in the firewood, the mouse brought the water from the nearby brook. Each did his work faithfully and contentedly. But one day, while the hen was going to the forest for wood, a busybody crow <laughs> asked her what she was doing. When told, the crow complained that the hen was doing the hardest part of the work and that the rabbit and mouse were making an easy mark of her. Hmm. Try as she would, the thought kept rankling in the hen's mind. And when she returned home with her load of wood and her still heavier load of discontent, she cackled, I do the hardest work ever. We ought to change our jobs. Discontent spreads, as you know, and immediately the rabbit and mouse also thought they had been doing the hardest work. They agreed to change jobs. The mouse would cook, the rabbit would gather the firewood, the hen would bring the water. Well, as the rabbit hopped into the woods, a big fox trailed him, caught him, and ate him. <laughs> 
It gets better. The chicken put the pail into the creek, but the current pulled the pail down under and the chicken died. The mouse <laughs> wondered why they didn't come back, but he didn't wonder for long. While he was sitting on the edge of the big pot of soup, he lost his balance and fell in and died. <laughs> Through discontent, all three not only lost their happiness, but they lost their very lives. Let's pray. Lord, we want to be numbered amongst those of whom it could be said they are content in Christ. Lord, we don't want discontentment, complaining, murmuring, to be numbered amongst us, to be mentioned in our midst. Lord, thank you for this warning for us today. And forgive us, Lord, for our complaining, our discontent, our murmuring. In Jesus' name, amen.